So it's the uh, day after Easter. And uh, how was your weekend? It was way? good. Really good. You know, other than <laughs> other than the fact that we got about six inches of snow last night. The ob obligatory uh, Denver blizzard on Easter, right? Yeah. Exactly. 15 degrees. Lowest on record ever for April 13th. Crazy. Crazy. Right. Crazy. So much for I'm done warming. with it. But yeah. Anyway. Um, very strange for some people maybe to hear about uh, snow on Easter, but also equally strange for people to think about going to church virtually with their iPad on Easter, right? You guys? It's probably, you know, you think about it, and our, and our pastor said this in a service, and he said, this is maybe the first time in thousands of years that, that literally the entire globe has been kept from going to church on Easter, which is really hard to imagine. Uh, but I think the cool thing, though, about it is, is, you know, church was never meant to be restrained within four walls. It's Great always point. been, it's always been the design of it, should have been, always been to be outwardly focused. And we've become so inwardly focused as a church that this is forcing us, mm -hmm. the church, to get outside of the walls, be creative. And I, and I heard somebody say, you know, the church probably advanced technically, mm -hmm. advanced 20 years in the last 20 days. Is that just because breaking the paradigm of what yeah. the, the, the what it it's cookie cutter, right? I mean, not to not to put the church, we're coming alongside the church. We yeah. love the church. We're part of the church. Yeah. Um, but we know that cookie cutter routine. It says we're going to start with praise and worship, then we're going to do offering, then we're going to et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but it's it's getting people to kind of think outside the box and rethink how they're presenting the gospel to the world. Yeah, it's it really is, and it's it's you know I've just seen, and you could probably speak to your own experience. We go to different churches. And you could probably speak to your church that you've you've been attending and, and watching online. It's amazing how far they've come just in a month. True. Technically. It's really cool to see how they're starting to get thinking outside the box and doing some different things. There's still, you know, there's still some that are restrained to this certain mode, but it's cool to see the church being challenged and stepping up to the challenge. And I, I just hope that once things go back to normal, that the church continues to leverage the momentum that they gained through this new platform. Yeah, so. this whole idea of where before it was, okay, we're going to have our service, our in-stadium experience, if you will, yeah. if we put it in the vernacular of a football game, um, and we're going to happen to record it, and for those that are sick or that don't know about it, just moved here or whatever, they want to check it out, it's online, but that's an afterthought, yeah. right? And maybe it becomes more of a, uh, a, 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 an approach that's planned to be able to reach yeah, people. Strategic. This, it's yeah, strategic. strategic. As opposed That's to an important. afterthought, throw up a camera. Yeah. Let's be strategic on how we can use it. And right. I hope I hope the church continues to take advantage of that. So this whole paradigm shift uh, that the church is going through now, of course, you know, we spent the, the weekend um, because of the snow, because of the quarantine, etc. cetera, um, spent it inside watching Jesus movies. That's what you do on Easter when during quarantine. Saw, I think, four different ways of the, I mean, the same story, but just a different presentation. It was kind of interesting. Uh, one was really cheesy. The one was really good. Risen, I mm. highly recommend. Outstanding. Um, but as I, as I saw each one of them, the same thought struck me, which was, you know, inevitably have Peter denial, resurrection, mm -hmm. you know, death, burial, resurrection, mm -hmm. hasn't appeared yet to the, to the disciples. What does Peter do? goes back to fishing, right? Walking in condemnation, knowing that he's denied, not even knowing Jesus. Um, and he went back to what he always knew. And I'm, I'm putting myself in his, in his place, just imagining the emotion, the thought, the feeling, etc. And then what happens? They're out there fishing. Jesus walks on the shore, calls out to them, said, hey, try the other side of the boat. Of course, he recognizes that um, because he told him the same thing when he first called him. And immediately... Peter was like, that's, that's the Lord. And he, the Bible says he took off his garment and dove into the water to go to the, uh, to go to the shore. Then there's the teaching, the, the restoral of Peter, which is, I think, one of the most moving things in all of Scripture. Uh, and, and Jesus then ascends. And there's a, it's an cre incredible moment where he's just called up and he ascends to heaven. And, and he says, hey, greater things you're going to do. I'm going to be with you always to the end of the, end of the earth. Go you therefore and make disciples, right? So he gives them this charge and he spent, I mean, he just totally changes the paradigm. Mm -hmm. Wait, you mean you're not going to teach us anymore? Wait, you mean when I don't understand something, you're not going to come alongside 
Because the Holy Spirit wouldn't yet, right? Yeah. So wait, 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 wait. Jesus, can you imagine? Don't go. Wait a minute. We're not ready. We're not ready. I, I think I think it was that. And I, you also got to think of the context of these men that were called out, right? If you think back to this culture, the dream of every little boy growing up mm. is not to be the quarterback of the Denver Broncos or, you know, to be a, an all-star pitcher or whatever, to be a lawyer or a doctor or an attorney, you know, whatever. It that, that, that might be a dream that you have. The dream for every little boy growing up in, in this culture was to become a rabbi. And these guys yeah. obviously had been rejected. They were, mm-hmm. they were rejected rabbis. They, they, they didn't have the muster, right, in order to become a rabbi, or at least other rabbis felt like they didn't line up. And so they, they thought their, their chance was gone, mm-hmm. right? So now they're, they're grown men for the most part. They have jobs. They're probably doing exactly what their father had done. So if their father was a fisherman, they were a fisherman. If their father was a farmer, they were a farmer. If their, their father was a carpenter, like Jesus, uh, then, then he was a carpenter. And so these men had kind of resolved themselves to, like, well, I guess this is the way life is going to be. Then mm-hmm. Jesus comes along, calls them out, says, I'm going to train you to be a rabbi. Come follow me. Their dream comes alive again, only for him to disappear once again. So they, they've been on this roller coaster of emotions of, uh, you know, not having what they desire, then getting the dream, and then it seemingly being taken away. So these guys are left in this incredible place when Jesus... Peter had four or five just missteps there. And man, what a man of faith. And as you pointed out before, he's the oldest disciple, so he was in charge of speaking on behalf of the group. Yeah. So he often had the foot in the mouth, yeah. the shoe in the mouth or whatever, um, because of that responsibility. Yeah, he gets, he gets a bad rap. He does. But, you know, here he, you know, Jesus is going to wash their feet. And Peter says, no, 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 Jesus, no. I know who you are. Amazing that he, because before Jesus said, hey, Fuss and Bud hadn't, hadn't revealed this to you. Yeah. My father in heaven did. This time he says, I, and he treats him as he should. But Jesus responds and said, listen, you don't understand. If I don't, if I don't wash your feet, you're not, you have no place with me in heaven. That's my paraphrase. And what does Peter say? Well, then start with my head, Bubba. Go all the way down. <laughs> Exactly. I need it all. So he had just gone through this stuff where it's evident that he doesn't like quite get this whole kingdom come to earth and, you know, God living in me and all of that. So he didn't quite get it. So I can imagine where he would be like, what do we do now? Well, and you made a good point that I want to make sure everybody caught. And that is at this point that we're talking about the struggle that these guys are having, they did not have the Holy Spirit yet, right? right. So it's easy for us to look back and, and go, why did the disciples not buy in earlier? Why didn't they get it? Why didn't they see it? Why were they so stubborn? And we got to remind ourselves that it's the Holy Spirit that reveals the deity of Jesus so true. to the heart of the believer, yeah. right? It's not our own intellect. It's not our ability to figure it out on our own. It literally is God removing the veil through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives that allows us to see the truth. And so the fact that even these men would go as far as they did without the Holy Spirit uh-huh. is pretty miraculous if you think about it. it you and I were talking um, before we even started filming just a little bit about the work of the Holy Spirit that gets done underneath the covers. Yeah, And it's exactly that. It's the same Spirit that reveals Christ to us, the same Spirit that raised Him from the dead is working in, in us, um, is what the Bible says. Um, and let's talk about what it means for the spirit to be working in us. Does that mean that, you know, that we have no responsibility, right? And that, uh, that, that basically Peter, going back to that, you know, when Jesus, uh, ascended to heaven, basically said, Hey, good luck. Good luck with that. And Peter kind of sat back and said, okay, well, if he's going to do something in me, I, I, I'll just wait here. Yeah. You know, I, I think what the if we had to boil it down, what these guys were dealing with, and certainly Peter is the primary one that we're using as the example, although all, I'm sure all the disciples had the same wrestling match going on in their head, if not saying it out loud, and that is really, it's an issue of identity, right? That's really what mm-hmm. Peter and the disciples were struggling with, and, and if we're honest with ourselves, that's what most of us struggle with mostly, is, is this identity. In other words, who am I to be able to care, carry this burden Right of what mm-hmm. Jesus put on him, because what did he say to him? Now go make disciples of all nations. I put it on you to go. Now I'm going to be with you, right. and I'm going to empower you. But go, and they still couldn't understand again because they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. They didn't understand what he meant by "I will be with you." They were probably thinking, you know, he'd physically be with them. Maybe 
you know, he would come alongside them in some way that they, they didn't understand quite yet. Mm -hmm. And so really what they're struggling with this is this issue of identity and, and translated is this, this idea of righteousness. How do I remain in this place of right standing before God yep. in order for me to work out the things for which he is destined for me, right? And so you have this one side of the coin is just, do I just wait, right? Because Romans 5.17 says that righteousness is not anything we can earn in and of, our, in and of ourselves. Mm -hmm. it's, it's freely given to us through Jesus. So you have, to your point, you have one side of that struggle that says, well, I can't earn it, so I'll just wait for it. And then the other side of that says, well, then i, I got to go get it. Mm -hmm. i got to go somehow manufacture it. i got to go find out ways to be righteous. I gotta go find out ways to be more pure. I gotta find out ways to be more disciplined. Or in other words, you know, like the like the Pharisees, I gotta make sure everybody thinks that I'm the man. Right? So so the more things change, the more they stay the same. It's basically you're describing, <laughs> you're taking us back in time to a, a scene with the disciples, but you're also describing present day. No question. Uh, you know, and what, what men in particular wrestle with. The struggle two thousand years later is exactly the struggle as it was then, and that is who am I, right? Who am I to carry, carry the banner of Christ on a daily basis? And how do I walk in a place of, of right standing on a consistent basis? Mm -hmm. and if you would flip the screen real quick, this is something I just threw together today that I think graphically, I think represents pretty well what we're talking about. And it's this idea that I'm going to strive for righteousness. And that ultimately is focused on the external, right? I want everybody to see that I'm righteous and that I'm holy and that and that I, I'm the man. Uh, that's the pharisaical mindset mm. on this side of it. The other side of it says, well, I can't obtain righteousness in and of myself, so I'm just going to wait on God. Well, the problem with that is you have no accountability because you're saying, well, God's going to have to do it in me, and if he doesn't, well, I guess God chose not to put righteousness upon me. To a certain degree, that second thing is right, and the first thing is right. It is. So what's so what's the balance? Yeah, that, that's that's that alignment, and, and that's what you know. That's what Peter and the disciples were struggling with was, and we're we're struggling with yeah. on a daily basis. Is what does that look like? If I have to wait on God and I can't go create it, what does it look like? And it's all about. We talked a couple episodes about positioning and alignment, right? And mm -hmm. positioning being, you know, receiving Christ as our Lord and Savior, which which now positions us before the Father as a son. But what we're really describing here is not necessarily that. That's the beginning, and it has to start there. But really what we're talking about is this idea of alignment, yeah. of making sure that we stay in right standing, stay in alignment with the Father on a daily basis. So let's unpack that a little bit further. Yeah. So in and of ourselves, I'm thinking about this, the human strivings bit of it. We can't just rely on these, because we all we know what that looks like. We know that the forced rhythms of our life that we try to introduce that says pray this amount of time read the scripture here do the good deed mm -hmm. go on the weekend to, to serve the homeless i mean these by themselves that they are and even together they're they're great things to do but they don't produce righteousness they don't produce righteousness yeah. right well, they should be a result of the work that god is doing in us in producing righteousness in us. Well, right? I, I, exactly. I think you're only talking about half the equation, though, because yeah. what you're talking about is, okay, I want to do good things. Mm -hmm. What yeah. about the struggle with sin? Sure. Because right? that's also a component of righteousness. Yep. And obedience versus disobedience. And this idea that I have this deeply ingrained sin habit within me, right? right. It's it's lust, it's pride, it's anger, Ego. it's... It's drug addiction. It's whatever it might be. Everybody has their own own deal, right? Has their own deeply ingrained sinful nature that some, they that they turn to. Some of us have multiple. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. We can all raise our hands here, sitting at this table. That's for sure. But but the challenge is now in this this idea of of striving because again we don't want to sin, right? And so let's talk about that first, uh, as opposed to just pursuing good things, just, just keeping off the naughty list, right, yeah. of, of trying to be good and not sin. And this mindset that, that the culture teaches us, our world teaches us, is just, hey, you gotta be, you just got to be strong. you got to have willpower. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Keep telling yourself, don't do it, right? And, and the problem is, well, you tell me, what's the problem with that? 
Well, I mean, there's multiple problems with it, but I guess the first one that occurs to me is that that if you abstain from fill in the blank, if you don't do that, then you're setting yourself up to say, because I didn't, I'm righteous, mm -hmm. right? I've, I've now set up a system whereby I earn righteousness, right? Because um, who gets the glory if me? Because right. it's my it's my that's willpower right. that's the God of my life yeah. is is what that's what that's saying without realizing that there's a bigger journey of transformation that we're each individually on that by the way isn't a undefeated you know Floyd Mayweather boxing record of fifty right. and O or whatever he is okay there's along in there there's missteps steps there's mistakes right there's failures. Big ones, small ones, but it's part of that journey of transformation. Um, in fact, I was thinking about, there's a scripture in 2 uh, Corinthians 3 and 18, and it's kind of complicated, and I won't go deep dive on it, but it says, We all with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord. We're beholding the glory of the Lord, and we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Um, in the King James, it says, as in a mirror, I'm reading from the ESV, but it says, we behold in the mirror, the glory of God. What do you see when you look in the mirror? Like on a reflection, a reflection of yourself, right? It'd be really weird. If you looked in the mirror, you may want this. You look in the mirror and you see I, my face. I knew that's what you wanted. I knew. I knew. <laughs> yes, I made it. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, but the point being, you see a reflection of your current state, of your current self in the mirror when you look there. And God says, when you look in the mirror, you have, I, I have made you the glory of God mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. in your imperfect state, but I'm transforming you as well into that same image from glory to glory. In other words, I've made you perfect. Okay, let's, let me stop you there. Yeah. I love that. So let's talk about that transformation, right? Because that's what we all desire. Yep. We want to be transformed. And I agree with you. We're in the process of transformation, sanctification, right? is what we're working through right now. And so this idea is how do we become sanctified? That's really the question here. That's what Peter and the disciples were asking. That's what you and I struggle with every day is, is what's it look like to be sanctified so ultimately we can walk in the power and authority that the Lord called us to and to carry out the purposes for which he's established for us before the beginning of time, right? And and what, what allows us to move in this, this place of sanctification in this transformation is, is alignment. Mm. This is where it happens, right here. And so we have just a couple minutes left, yep. about a minute and a half left. I want to talk about this alignment because it's so important, and i got a feeling we're going to be talking about this a lot more in future podcasts, uh, in future episodes. But let's talk about this alignment right now because I'm going to tell you this right now. Mm. Simply relying on willpower, it will never succeed in helping us to overcome those deep ingrained sin, ha sin habits. It will not succeed. It will not work. Mm. The only thing that's going to work is when we align ourselves. And we align ourselves in multiple ways. We align ourselves with reading the Word of God. We align ourselves in prayer. We align ourselves in meditation, in fasting, in the disciplines of the faith, right? That's why, that's why again, re reverting back to a previous episode when we talked about those offensive of linemen and how... They, they take it back to the basic fundamentals of the faith, which mm. allow them to be successful when the bullets start flying. What's going to allow us to overcome the evil one yep. when he comes upon us, because he, he's coming at us like a roaring lion, waiting to devour us, right? He's waiting for that opportune time. What's going to allow us to overcome that is when we've been in the practice of aligning ourselves through prayer, reading the word, and the disciplines of faith. So all of those disciplines just occurred to me. They're not for God. They're not for God, for, for us to give a sacrifice or an offering to God of our time that, that we are offering to him on, on, uh, on, the, on the altar to say, I am going to sacrifice this time and give you my prayer and give He's you my study. It's for us, isn't That's it? That's right. It's to set an environment whereby we can be changed, not through our willpower, but through his spirit. That's right. And once, once we align ourselves... And that internal transformation begins to occur. Guess what's going to happen? The external changes. Mm. The fruits of the Spirit will come out of us supernaturally or naturally, however you want to look at it. Yeah. It's not anything we have to strive for. It's not anything we have to conjure up. 
It's not anything we have to have enough willpower in order to, to make sure we overcome the moment. It's simply just going to come out of us. That, that's good news. It doesn't, um, it doesn't alleviate our responsibility to enter into those disciplines. That's right. But our success in those disciplines is not the determinant in this linear equation That's right. of the benefit of, of righteousness that we realize through the doing of that. And we'll close with this, um, because I was just reminded of this, because I read it this morning, as a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. It says, we are the fragrance of Christ. So when I was thinking of the fruits just coming out of us, yes. it's that fragrance. To some, it's the smell of life. To others, it's the smell of death but it's the fragrance of Christ that we're all called to reflect. That's good. That's pretty cool. Hey, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on The Pursuit. See ya.